Good afternoon. My name is Diana Warren, and I'm the director of the Interior Museum, and it is my pleasure to welcome you here today for our lunchtime lecture series. Each month we focus on one of our, our various bureaus or our partners or the ways that our, our bureaus interconnect on um, a various uh, number of themes throughout, um, throughout America and abroad. Um, Emily Paulus is joining us today. She has coordinated management of federal museum collections and compliance with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, or NAGPRA, uh, for nearly 20 years uh, with the Bureau of Land Management, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Interior Department, former uh, colleague here at the Interior Museum. Uh, she has spearheaded initiatives as well as guided others to partner and negotiate with museums <coughs> and universities holding federal collections to develop innovative solutions for preservation needs, access and use for research and education, coordination with descendant and resource communities, and repatriation. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Emily Pops. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just delighted to be here uh, with you today and pleased to return to the Interior Museum uh, where I started my career with the department as an intern in 1999. So any interns out there, or especially National Council for Preservation Education interns, that's where I got my start. Uh, so I'm pleased to be back. Uh, many thanks to Diana for this invitation to participate in the monthly lecture series. The title of my talk is Far From Home, Bringing Archaeological Collections and Ancestors Home to Alaska. And we'll focus on a recent interagency effort to retrieve a sizable collection of native Alaskan ancestral remains, or human remains, and artifacts collected 70 to 110 years ago from public lands in Alaska. The collections were curated in a prominent East Coast institution, but we took the effort to move the collection and return it to Alaska, placing it in another reputable institution. Some of the collections will remain there, um, and some will be repatriated to descendant communities. My role in this project uh, is not one of being an expert in Alaskan archaeology. Uh, my role is much more that of perhaps expediter or facilitator uh, in, in this process. This case study provides a valuable and perhaps lesser known view into some of the Department of Interior's work and responsibilities to the American public regarding care of museum collections, artifacts, specimens recovered from the public lands, and the associated um, uh, records. It also highlights responsibilities for upholding the rights of Native American, um, the rights of descendant communities to Native American human remains and certain categories of cultural property. And it also shows a thoughtful consideration of the wishes of local and regional communities to retain a connection to the antiquities or the archaeological resources associated with their home as a source of identity, pride, and in some cases heritage tourism and economic opportunity. So as I narrate this story, I'll aim to weave in some of these broader concepts uh, and frankly address uh, some uncomfortable histories, which provide context for this story and illustrate current responses to some of the history of archaeology, certainly changing museum practices, the role of the federal government in upholding a public trust for the care of collections, and particular responsibilities to Indian tribes, Native Alaskan villages, and corporations. So over the last century, researchers from across the US and Europe explored native villages and archaeological sites across Alaska, collecting human remains and artifacts from the public lands. This case is but one. And I want to caution that some of the images I'm going to share are going to include exposed burials of human remains and skeletal remains. So let's begin. In July of 2017, so just not uh, quite a year ago, a team representing the Bureau of Land Management, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, the National Park Service, along with representatives from the University of Alaska, Fairbanks Museum of the North, retrieved 38 individuals, 38 sets of Native American human remains, and 1,592 artifacts from the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
These ancestors and collections originated from Alaska, and there are three circles that uh, you can see. Green circle um, for the top of the world, Twin Islands, and Jones Island, we'll talk about that expedition. St. Lawrence Island, subject to two of the expeditions, and the Aleutians, focusing on uh, Umnath Island. So let's learn part of their story, beginning not when they lived, but after they were buried, and when they were found by explorers and researchers and made into museum collections. The first collection was made 110 years ago with Anglo-American Polar Expedition, which intended to look for undiscovered lands in the Arctic aboard the Duchess of Bedford, a schooner with no engines, so powered only by wind. The expedition was led by a Danish naval adventurer and American geologist, and you can imagine that these types of expeditions required a lot of coordination and a lot of resources. They need sponsors. Apparently, to satisfy one of the funders, the expedition added an ethnographic component. Uh, so Mr. Stephenson, who was an anthropologist associated with Harvard University, was hired to study the natives encountered during the expedition and acquire artifacts for the Peabody and Royal Ontario Museums. So I want to give you a sense that this is really on top of the world where these guys are in their wind-powered schooner. The Duchess of Bedford became locked in ice and ultimately destroyed, and a camp was set on Flaxen Island, and up here, um, using the remains of the ship to build a cabin in an area now just north of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge in the Beaufort Sea. And this location actually is uh, on the, on the um, National Register of Historic Places, um, principally associated with um, the geologist Leffingwell, um, who used this as his campsite made out of the former schooner for several seasons. Stephenson, the anthropologist, ultimately left the expedition and lived with the Inuit of the Mackenzie Delta in Canada over 1907 and 1908 over the winter. And following that experience, the Arctic remained the focus of his research and studies for his career. For instance, between 1906 and 1918, Stephenson undertook three long expeditions living with and among the native villages in Alaska and Canada, adopting the native way of life, which he chronicled in his book, for instance, his 1922 book, My Life with the Eskimo. Stephenson pioneered research into Arctic living and methods for enduring or really thriving in this harsh environment. This included a low uh, carbohydrate diet focused on meat and fish. So perhaps he was a forefather to Atkins. Uh, well, I joke and perhaps take some liberties here, but a point is that this is the first expedition brought this young researcher to the Arctic and it would be the focal point of his career. But I digress. This story is about the human remains and artifacts that he collected. I mentioned that Stephenson was tasked with making excavations and collecting for the Peabody and Royal Ontario Museums, and he did. Uh, 221 items were deposited at Harvard University's Peabody Museum, according to their records including human bones, fishing and hunting equipment, pipes, weapons, and tools, ceremonial objects, jewelry, and bone ornaments. And he took fairly detailed notes in their narrative form and give a sense of the excavation and camp life. For instance, he wrote on June 11, 1906, on Flaxen Island, skeleton in ravine bank, southeast part of island near native houses, apparently body had been deposited in ordinary log grave, later erosion and lateral development of river had caused bank to crumble and bones of wood had tumbled about and mixed. Only a small part of frontal bone showed above turf. From buried position and absences of regular parallel logs, the native Saxawana told us that he inferred the man to have been murdered and hidden. But the geologic explanation seems more reasonable to me. On Jones Island, he later wrote on July 22nd, that same year, 1906, Last evening, I commenced digging in a trench along a seaward wall at the Kashim, or house, but found the drifted sand so deep that I thought it hopeless, with one spade and short shortness of grub to try it. You see, our food supply will surely not all allow us to stay more than three days, and the boys are already fearing possible starvation. I must give up digging for the present for the, um, in the ways to take off the sod and wait for the sun to do its work, meaning melt. The following objects were found, flint chipper, mallet of antler found in wall on ground level, 
detaching pieces from spear slightly engraved, found in wall, ground level, matlock blade of whale's rib, and he goes on. As I mentioned, 221 artifacts were, lot, were accessioned by the Peabody Museum from this exposition from various locales, and this included 10 sets of human remains and 41 objects, 41 artifacts, 12 clearly from graves, based on his descriptions, from Flaxen, Jones, and Twin Islands. These were federal lands. The Antiquities Act of 1906 had passed that same summer and required any gatherings of relics and examinations of ruins to be conducted with a permit. But although this expedition didn't have a permit, the federal hook was established. Materials from federal land needed to be deposited in a public museum in perpetuity. And I'm going to come back to the Antiquities Act. But let's move on to our next expedition. A few years after the American Polar Expedition, Harvard University's Museum of Comparative Biology participated in an expedition in 1913 uh, throughout Alaska and the Bering Sea. Aboard a little schooner named the Polar Bear, a party of private big game hunters and scientists from Harvard, the Smithsonian, and the University of California set off to make an exhaustive study of animal and bird life. And during their year and a half journey, the crew visited the Aleutian Islands, Point of Hope, Atka, Russia, Herschel Island, Chukai Peninsula, Nome Indian Point, Siberia, Point Barrow. And throughout their voyage, the crew killed and recovered countless numbers of Arctic birds, walruses, mountain sheep, and whales. Facing a similar fate as the Duchess of Bedford, the polar bear was also trapped in ice, but she was not destroyed. Four crew members actually went over land, and the mating crew camped on the edge of the world waiting nine, eight months for the ice to melt the following spring. And I uh, trace this, I think, to actually a similar location as to where the other boat uh, froze, um, which was over here. So we're still up at the top of the world. No one perished, which is amazing to me. Uh, however, one of the crew later wrote a book uh, about his experience. It was called Icy Hell. <laughs> <laughs> It sells on Amazon for over $600. <laughs> I should mention that this expedition was heavily reported by, there were a lot of photo photographers on this expedition. So there's a fair number of uh, photos, um, some available online, others in, in archives. But as you can see, it was principally focused on natural history and big game hunting. But along the way, the ship encountered natives who traded, educated, and helped them. And a number of them joined the crew. One of the passengers, Bernard Killiam, noted in his journal one particular couple who he was quite fond of, um, Mr. and Mrs. Edloon. And they stayed with him for a week, and sharing their stories from their culture and imparted knowledge about their way of life. Bernard wrote that his stay with Edloon and his wife was one of the highlights of his trip, and he enjoyed every minute of it. So this expedition was principally a natural history tour for research and hunting, and then there was this ethnographic, cultural, uh, uh, early cultural tourism approach. But the group also conducted some excavations. Why not? Collected some human remains. We know that during the expedition, at least 11 skulls, human skulls, were collected and donate, were collected, and then subsequently donated to the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard University, who then turned and donated them to the Peabody Museum, its sister organization. Uh, a few years later, another skull from this same expedition was donated, so somehow didn't make the first transaction. We know this from, their, um, from the museum records maintained by the institution. Seven of those skulls were from St. Lawrence Island, which was federal land administered by the General Land Office at the time, predecessor, predecessor to the Bureau of Land Management. And here I'm showing you some specimen tags and a portion of the accession le ledger. And on the map, I'm showing you one where they trapped the knife. This is St. Blue, this is St. Lawrence Island. You can also actually see that the accession ledger has lots of information. Skull with mandible, St. Lawrence Island, Bering Sea. So 30, over the next 30 years, expeditions uh, still undertaken to the Arctic for research on both the indigenous population and archaeological remains. Researchers such as Elder Dijkla, Otto Geist, Ted Bank, Latims, raised students, 
made collections. One of her Ditch Club students was William Laughlin, who made his first trip to Alaska in 1938. And he returned in 1948, a PhD candidate at Harvard. Laughlin directed the expedition to the Aleutian Islands to study and report on the history, culture, language, physical condition, and origins of the Aleutian people. The expedition was funded by Harvard, the Viking Fund, and a contract through the Navy Research Group, which the latter of which focused on biomedical research of the native population. To quote from the expedition proposal and description, the object of the research is to look for physical and cultural adaptations made in answer to the demands of their particular environment. Um, living, uh, live, Living population and the physical and cultural remains of their forebearers in archaeological sites will be studied. The headquarters of the expedition will be at the village of Nokolski on Umnak Island, where tests at the prehistoric population of the village indicate a continuous occupation from the time of the original settlement of the islands. The living population and skeletons from the prehistoric periods at Nikolsky and at other sites will provide a complete record of the history of mankind on these islands. So Laughlin studied the loop population of Nokolski on Onak Island and also excavated their old village site, which included the Chuluka Mound, an area of occupation for almost 4,000 years. One of Laughlin's students later described the expedition. They excavated by day, took measurements in blood, and recorded ethnography at night. And I want to read an excerpt from a journal from one of the, one of the um, expedition team members, a uh, man named by Alan Mang, who, if I can say, I almost find charming. His, his uh, journals are um, really a wonderful record of, of uh, their, their life, their expedition, um, and, and quite informative uh, on their on their day to day and their research interests and frankly some of their interpersonal conflicts. But third Tuesday, June 29th, 1948. A, late, a light rain this morning, but out to work anyway, against, much against Shade's wishes. Shade's another archaeologist on the expedition. Left the, left the skeleton I exposed yesterday in the hopes that perhaps it might dry out a bit. We have now acquired a ladder, which is most useful. The ladder is quite useful, um, going from one level to another and, and much, better than, much safer than climbing up sides each time. Soon after starting work, I found a baby skeleton, but the skull was smashed. Another ivory labyrinth turned up, bone points, fish, herbs, awls, flakers, and reams, pins, adds, um, scrapers, grinding stones, and wedges were also found. By noon, we were pretty dirty and wet, so we spent the afternoon indoors. I cleaned and segregated and shade, shade as at last started cataloging. This was really piling up on us, and I was glad to get started. Tonight everyone went to church after supper to take photos. By that, going to church is going to church with, with the villagers of Nikolsky. As I, now, uh, as I have now, as I have some, I did not go, but stayed here and cleaned up some specimens and bones. Information from the natives is being slowly acquired. Vegetation that is used as medicine for food, myths, and so on. There is one about an old stump, in which, which is said to be under a little building near the church. When this stump, or post, according to some, grows tall enough to knock the ball off the top of the building, then the whole life of the natives will be completely changed, or the world will come to an end. There seems to be a chance that their life may be changed shortly, for there is rumor that the army may take over the entire island. If the ball should happen to fall at the time they were evacuated, then of course their superstitious beliefs would be much enhanced. We learn also that there is a, a ghost here, something called the outside man. It seems that many believe in it, and some will not go in the dark, but none of them scoff at it. The next day, June 30th, Wednesday. It was raining hard this morning, so we could not go to work. Worked on records, made maps of the site, and so on. After lunch, the rain was not so heavy, so we went out. A piece of pottery, or something that looked very much like it turned up, 
skeleton of a youth about 10 years old was uncovered in the late afternoon, his head under a rock. This was somewhat an, of an unusual burial in that the, the body was extended and on its back. The first of this type of burial I have seen here, normally they are flexed. And it goes on. He, he journaled every day. One of my interests in the journals and the archival records is being able to tie that information ultimately to the individuals and the artifacts we, we ultimately recovered um, and will be doing uh, documentation on. But let's stick with Laughlin. In 1949, he completed his dissertation with this research from the 48 expedition. And last summer, while I was in Cambridge, I had the opportunity to review his work. And I'll confess it was a bit of a personal experience for me because for many, many years I had been trying to get information about this collection. And I thought, if I find the dissertation, then surely that will tell me all about this collection. And so I opened it up and the spine creaked. And the archivist said, I think you might be the first person to look at this. <laughs> to which my heart sank. Um, and then I opened it up and I started flipping through. And I realized that 90% of his dissertation is on the uh, biomedical research that he did on the, the then current population. And about 10% is on comparative to 11 skulls. He collected more than that. There was nothing on the material culture. So it was kind of this shocking moment. Okay, okay, I need to find more. How, how else are we gonna find out about these, these artifacts? Will we find field notes? And we have found some, in May's, May's journal I actually found last month, so um, it's coming together. But anyhow, so there were no reference to the artifacts, uh, although these would later be studied by students. And Laughlin moved on to have a prominent career in physical anthropology, moving to the University of Oregon, University of Wisconsin, University of Connecticut, and ultimately retiring in 1999. He has since passed away. His primary field of specialization was physical anthropology, including the Aleutian Siberian studies, human biology, population, history, and human evolution. And over the years, he made over 20 trips to Alaska, to the Aleutians, to study its peoples, to dig, to collect. His research there culminated in the publication of a 1980 book, uh, Aleut's Survival of the Bering Land Bridge. We have so far found collections made by Laughlin in eight institutions so far and counting. Um, but from this particular trip, uh, he deposited 1,655 items at the Peabody Museum, we know from their records, including human remains and artifacts, bone points, harp harpoons, stone scrapers. All of the archeolo archeological material he recovered on his trip from federal lands administered either by the Bureau of Land Management or by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So last July, we being BLM and Fish and Wildlife retrieved 21 sets of remains and 1,542. And so if you're tracking all of my, my numbers, that's not everything. But that's what the museum had. So as I've talked about these collections and these three expeditions, I've paused and always noted that there is a connection to federal lands, General Land Office, Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So what? what? Why does land status matter? Why would the BLM and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service all these years later have a current interest in these collections? What is the federal interest? What's the federal role? What is the federal responsibility to the American public? and to local communities, to researchers, Indian tribes, Native Alaskan villages and corporations, Native Hawaiian organizations, blah. This interest, the roles and responsibilities are defined in a suite of laws enacted by Congress with varying regulations further implementing this direction, which fundamentally outline a philosophy and a set of values that archeological resources are significant, important to all Americans, and that descendant communities may have particular rights and interests. So let me just give you a quick overview of these authorities and direction to put the current uh, um, Department of Interior Bureau activity into context. 
So there's a long history of, of federal protections for antiquities going back to 1906 with an act for the preservation of American antiquities signed by President Theodore Roosevelt. This was a visionary act to safeguard archeological and historic properties on federal lands from haphazard digging and looting. While the Antiquities Act is most often referenced in current media today regarding presidential establishment of monuments, in the context of collections and management of archeological sites, this act established that archeological sites are most valuable for the information they contain or their commemorative associations, not as commercial resources like timber or minerals that have primarily a monetary value. The Antiquities Act declared the first uh, federal policy that the management of archeological sites was in the public interest, asserting that permits for the examination of ruins, the excavation of archeological sites, the gathering of objects of antiquity may be granted to institutions deemed qualified, that the examinations, excavations, and gatherings are undertaken for the benefit of reputable museums, universities, colleges, and other scientific or educational institutions with a view towards increasing the knowledge of such objects and gatherings made for permanent preservation in public museums, public interest in these materials. This act established, by the United, established the United States government responsibility to manage cultural resources, initiated regulation of the investigation of those resources. So we'll flash forward to the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, sets out a very broad federal historic preservation policy and among uh, many uh, value statements, uh, purpose statements, the Congress finds and declares that the spirit and direction of the nation are founded upon and reflected in its historic heritage. And the cultural and historic foundations of the nation should be preserved as a living part of our community life and development in order to give a sense of orientation to the American people. That historic properties significant to the nation's heritage are being lost or substantially altered, often inadvertently, with increasing frequency, and that the preservation of these irreplaceable, this irreplaceable heritage is in the public interest, so that its vital legacy of cultural, educational, aesthetic, inspirational, economic, and energy benefits may maintain, excuse me, economic, excuse me, that's a flip of thing, can be maintained and enriched for future generations of Americans. So among the many sections of the National Historic Preservation Act, one section, directs the creation of regulations for the management of archaeological or collections associated with historic properties. I'll come back to that in a moment, the curation regulations, but let me uh, cover the successor to the Antiquities Act, uh, if you will. So 73 years after the Antiquities Act was enacted in 1906, it proved to be insufficient to protect archaeological sites that were increasingly threatened and damaged by unauthorized excavation and pillage. So Congress enacted ARPA, Archaeological Resources Protection Act, in 1979 to further solidify federal policy that archaeological resources on public and Indian lands are an accessible and irreplaceable part of the nation's heritage. They're increasingly endangered. ARPA was enacted to secure for the present and future benefit of the American people the protection of these resources and sites on public and Indian lands. The statute builds on the Antiquities Act with more refined provisions regarding permitting investigations and retains the requirement that collections be deposited in a public museum for the long term or in perpetuity. So not a statute, but I referenced that NHPA uh, uh, gave direction for promulgation of regulations as did ARPA uh, for management of archeological collections. So curation of federally owned and administered archeological collections, uh, those regulations were um, made final or promulgated in 1990. And they established definitions, standards, procedures, and guidelines to be followed by federal agencies to preserve collections of prehistoric and historic material remains and associated records. Recovered under the authority of the Antiquities Act, Reservoir Salvage Act, which I didn't mention, National Historic Preservation Act, and Archaeological Resources Protection Act. The federal agency official is responsible for the long-term management and preservation of pre-existing and new collections. Such collections shall be placed in a repository, museum, university institution, uh, with adequate long-term curatorial capabilities, and so on. Why? Why do we need these regulations 
government collections. Well, federal property should be cared for to particular standards and outline the, the values and interests of the public in these, um, these collections, these artifacts laid out in the Antiquities Act, the National Historic Preservation Act, and the Archaeological Resources Protection Act, that they, they needed to be preserved and maintained to particular standards for the long term or in perpetuity and made available for research, exhibition, and other appropriate uses. So, so far I've talked about public interest and benefit. But there are classes of objects so important to American Indians that Congress passed another law to assure Native Americans right to them in the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, enacted in 1990. NAGPRA protects ancestral remains, or NAGPRA addresses Native American human remains and funerary objects, as well as sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. The statute upholds the rights of Indian tribes, Native Alaskan villages and corporations, and Native Hawaiian organizations, the right to control the disposition of their ancestors and certain categories of cultural property. It, the law requires federal agencies and museums receiving federal funds to document and inventory their collections, consult with Indian tribes, Native Alaskan villages, and Native Hawaiian organizations, determine descendant or who has rights or cultural affiliation, and upon a valid claim, repatriate. This law established a, um, a responsibility for federal agencies and museums to act, to inventory their collections and consult. So this responsibility for conducting this work is based on a concept of control. And for federal agencies, this can tie to land. So control rests with the agency that managed the land at the time the collection was made. Given the sensitive nature of these materials and deadlines, this work has been met with a sense of urgency. But before I, continue, before I return to our case study, let me share a few challenges land management agencies face in meeting these responsibilities for collections care and as appropriate documentation, consultation, and repatriation. Under both the Antiquities Act and the Archaeological Resources Protection Act permitting standards, a museum had to be identified in the permit application and that would receive the collection and a catalog of what was collected be included in the final report. But there was nothing that required further follow-up by the agencies. And in fact, it wasn't until 1984 that most interior bureaus had authority to issue their own permits. Prior to that, the Office of the Secretary issued permits from 1906 to 1968, and the National Park Service Departmental Consulting Archaeologists on behalf of the bureaus did so until 1984. Between 1906 and 1986, more than 3,000 permits were issued. So in 1990, Curation and regulations are issued. Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act is enacted. And most agencies did not have readily available information about the location, scope, and content of collections, basically relying on museums housing them. So most successful NAGPRA compliance projects were achieved through collaboration and a little bit of funding between the museum holding the collection and the federal agency from which, land, from which lands the items were removed. So with that background, let's return to our Alaska collections and providing for the appropriate care and responsiveness to uh, descendant Native Alaskan communities. So the Bureau of Land Management and, and with our partner, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, uh, were responsible for ensuring the care of these collections. They came from BLM and, and fish lands. According to 36 CFR 79, the curation regulations covers pre-existing collections. Basic professional standards. Uh, for providing preservation protection and appropriate access and use. And of course, NAGPRA requires the agencies to inventory collections of the human remains and cultural items and report those to Indian tribes and through consultation determine affiliation, who has rights to the remains and cultural items. These responsibilities apply regardless of physical custody or possession. So from 1907, 1915, and 1948, we have three ex collections from expeditions I, I, I um, walked you through. They were from federal lands, and they were housed at the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology in Cambridge, Massachusetts. 
The collections were actually not made under a permit issued under the Antiquities Act. So there was no permit trail, but they were from federal land. So the BLM had collections and potentially repatriation responsibilities and didn't even know the collections existed. This is one of the challenges we face. However, we did learn about the collections over time. In 2001, Peabody Museum contacted the BLM lead archeologist in Alaska inquiring about land status of several locales. Well, BLM often knows land and we know land jurisdiction. Uh, so my colleague went through the list of locales that Peabody asked about and identified if it was GLO, General Land Office or Bureau of Land Management, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Forest Service, uh, state or other, um, and specifically identified BLM locales named Flaxman, Jones, and Twin Islands. The first two, oh, and St. Lawrence Island, the first two expeditions I mentioned. So a strong focus at this time, 2000, 2001, NAGPRA was enacted in 1990, so about 10, 11 years later, a strong focus of museums and federal agencies regarding museum collections was the need to address Native American human remains and inventory requirements. And some museums were figuring out the scope of their responsibilities. The collection was federal land, and they could identify the agency, well, maybe that would become the agency's priority, and not theirs. But responsibility was not always fully clear, and there are different perspectives and interpretations that have um, evolved over time. So for instance, <laughs> wouldn't, an agency, wouldn't an institution that sponsored expeditions and actively made these collections have some responsibilities to inventory them for this repatriation statute? Well, there are different interpretations on this. But after a few exchanges between the museum and the BLM in 2001 and outreach to the respective tribes, the matter actually lay dormant. In 2009, I come on the scene and I was contacted by a consultant working for the Chiluka Native Corporation, letting us know about the 1948 Laughlin material. And we initiated a discussion with the Peabody Museum about that collection, which apparently had not been tagged as potentially from federal lands. Our need to address NAGPRA remained urgent and compounded by learning of this other collection, which turned out to be quite sizable, 16 individuals, approximately 1,600 artifacts. The Peabody Museum acknowledged BLM's assertion of control and responsibility for the collection and explained that all services and activities the museum would now charge the BLM. This was not a unique stance, uh, but had been a change from other museums and universities we had worked with where we had partnered um, perhaps with some, some financial support, but nevertheless collaborated on this inventory and documentation work. But this was to be a contractual relationship. The BLM requested estimates to inventory the collection so that we can com complete our baseline NAGPRA work. The following year, BLM, our BLM, my colleague, BLM Alaska archeologist visited the museum in 2010 met with staff and learned that there was no active research on the collections, and they no longer had an active Arctic studies program, further that their uh, facility was quite full, and that the museum would be amenable to transferring the collection to another institution. So the BLM then requested an estimate for both an inventory of the collection and to ship it. At first, we had aimed to partner with the museum to complete the NAGPRA work, but really over time it seemed appropriate to move the collection given some of the, the capacity constraints that the museum had. And so we looked to another partner, and specifically the University of Alaska Museum of the North in Fairbanks, which is the main repository for archaeological collections in Alaska with whom the BLM and other federal agencies have a very strong relationship with the state-run institution. We had completed several successful NAGPRA projects and also just general uh, collections management work with them. And we, know, and we had relied upon them for their technical support, their ample Arctic expertise, their knowledge of the sites, locales, artifacts, and importantly, relationships with native Alaskan villages. The proximity, and while at first we were focused on the NAGPRA collection, we, we then looked at the entirety of the collection, materials that human remains and certain classes of artifacts, but then everything to move uh, to, to the Museum of the North. 
the proximity, expertise, and relationships would help with NAGPRA, and for the non-NAGPRA material, the collections could be incorporated into the Museum of the North's collections, part of an active research and education program for the university, immediate Fairbanks community, Alaska more broadly, including extension programs across the state. The Museum of the North was also very interested in returning collections to Alaska, because so many collections had been made uh, from, from their state um, during these historic expeditions and dispersed across the lower 48 states and beyond. We had uh, consulted with native uh, villages who had requested that their ancestors be returned home, and also that all of the collections from their communities be returned uh, to Alaska. Um, and I'll also note that <coughs> in the 1990s, 2010s was not the first time many of these villages had asked about the collections that had been made. Through some archival research for this project and another one, uh, I found a lot of requests, uh, especially in the 1970s, uh, for uh, where village leadership is asking archaeologists to, um, if they come and dig, to leave the materials there or ship them back. And in fact, in 1977, William Laughlin, who's kind of been an interesting character to me, but the more I get to know him through archives, the more complex character. 1977, he frantically tried to create a museum in the village of Nikolsky and, and laid out some pretty extensive plans and lining up funding. He was also looking for towards his retirement. And while I've just been talking about what was at Harvard Peabody, remember he made another 19, 20 trips to Alaska. He would, and that all that material was in Connecticut and would need to go somewhere. Ultimately, a, a museum in the village of Nicolsi was not constructed. That collection actually ended up in the Museum of the Aleutians. Um, so, so why Museum of the North? Sorry, just kind of catch you up on, on this institution. Uh, requisite facilities, community uh, relationships. So a plan was forming. The key details not settled. And over the next several years, discussions circled between the agency asking for estimates and the museum actually asking to verify control that the BLM did indeed have legal responsibility. And I will say, we're kind of a, we're not looking for work. <laughs> this was not intended as any kind of overreach. We were trying to ensure that we met our obligations under the statute uh, to descendant communities and to the American public for the broader collection. So the BLM and the Peabody are trying to, uh, and at the same time BLM and the Peabody are, are going through and trying to research and refine the information about the collections, because at this point, we actually still don't have a full inventory listing of the materials. So why wasn't this addressed sooner? Why is this taking so long? Land jurisdiction, not always clear, takes expertise and time to verify. The Laughlin collection included materials from sites on BLM lands, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service lands, as well as state lands, um, not state lands. And it was all in one museum accession. So the museum looked at it as one collection, and we would break it apart based on site or locale to figure out uh, land jurisdiction. And then the Navy had this interesting relationship to this, because remember, the Navy helped fund the expedition. And so there was some thought that maybe the Navy had some authority over this collection. Well, don't you love archives? Who got a copy of the contract for Navy research, which had nothing to do with the archaeological research, research that was done, all having to do with the, um, the medical uh, examinations. Um, and incidentally, the Navy wouldn't have had the authority to authorize the excavation on another agency's lands. But we had to sort all of that out um, and, uh, and, and all, unravel it all and distill it simply down to collections from BLM for general land office land, BLM responsibility from Fish and Wildlife Service land, Fish and Wildlife Service. Navy had no part. So finally in January of 2017, the matter of control was settled and the Peabody agreed to move forward with transferring the collection. By then, cost estimates were irrelevant because the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the University of Alaska Museum of the North, along with some local support from the National Park Service in Charlestown, Massachusetts, 
next door to Cambridge. We formalized a plan, and in July 17, July 2017, we met with the Peabody staff, inventoried, packed, and shipped the collection. So our final negotiations with the Peabody resulted in, the, in transfer documents that we all signed. We agreed to the terms. They assembled the collection, and they provided us a space to work, inventory, and pack, and they provided us a full catalog from their database. And over the next few months, according to our agreement, museum staff diligently supplied scans of all of the relevant associated documentation and records, like field notes, that helped put these materials into context. The records are critical to the research values in helping identify descendant groups with rights to claim the human remains and other cultural items. It's not just about the objects. So inventory and pack we did. Our process um, uh, was um, careful, planned. Museum people are the best. Um, uh, these materials are fragile, delicate, unique, sensitive. Uh, so the pressure was on to do a good and thorough job. Uh, and, have, and we documented every step of the way. So we track and locate an item with its catalog number, we know which box it is in, which pallet it's on. Um, it's hyper inventory tracking because this is irreplaceable material. Now I also want to pause and mention that again, the Native Alaskan ancestors, these are the boxes uh, that they were in. And I mentioned the dissertation. And I'm including this plate, uh, which is from the dissertation. Uh, this is the only plate the, of the 11 skulls used for comparative research in the dissertation. This is the only one that, that is a plate in the, in the, in the dissertation. So um, I noted that it has a number. Um, so I hurriedly went back to my team and asked, do we have this one? My team said no. We went back through all of the photos. We went back through the photos the museum provided us. We went back through the photos we took. We didn't have it. So this one's still out there. I have a feeling it might be at the University of Oregon, which is where Lachlan went next uh, on his journey. And we are actually in, in discussions right now with the University of Oregon for the Lachlan collections that are there. Okay. It's hard not to get a little personal about this. So more action. We loaded up our cargo vans and packed our boxes on pallets and ultimately we had four pallets containing 21 boxes, 18 boxes of human remains, with those 38 individuals. And hardest working team. And a couple of Alaska Airlines flights later, the Museum of the North retrieved our these, these individuals and these artifacts in Fairbanks and brought them to the next phase of their journey. And where they, were, where they remain today, um, almost a year later, the um, Museum of the North is, uh, we, the Bureau of Land Management has been reaching out to the um, descendant communities uh, who have, um, who all have an interest, I've listed them here because there are many, um, given the nature of the Alaska Village Corporation uh, arrangement. So we're initiating consultation and at the same time going through the collections that we received from the Peabody and trying to connect it with the documentation that was provided by the museum, as well as other information that we found. There are 120 boxes of archival material from Laughlin in Anchorage, for instance. Um, so trying to um, trying to trying to put the collections into context, so we know where they came from, so that we can um, hurry their return home if they're being repatriated. They're not subject to NAGPRA. But that information is valuable as their research interest. So over the last century, as I mentioned, researchers across the U.S. and Europe explored native villages and archaeological sites across Alaska. In this case, it's just about one. What I find so interesting as I delve into further into this project and those related to it, because each one leads to another, um, the history of archaeological and anthropological research in Alaska. 
And the number and complexity of expeditions and the resulting collections, massive quantities of artifacts excavated from Alaska and subsequently curated in museums in the lower 48 in Europe and Canada. And part of what I'm, we're tracking is the history of museums, where museums often would try to produce an encyclopedic collection and have something from everywhere. Uh, but more and more that focus is, is more focused in on particular um, regions and regional institutions like the Museum of the North or some of the other institutions that the BLM works with out in the Western states, there's a, there's a unique connection between the items, the sites and items, and, and um, the institution. People don't like their heritage to move far away. So today, federal agencies and museums curating federal collections, we have to collaborate on achieving our shared goals for the best use and care of these materials. And while this, this case study presents reasons for transferring a collection from one institution to another, and these transfers are, can be complex, expensive, time consuming, take much longer than you think they should, um, ultimately trying to make a decision that's in the best interest of the collection and its availability um, and benefit to the public where there is current curatorial research, interest, access to expertise, and to honor the wishes of descendant groups and source communities. And it also reveals some of the challenges of what it means to manage collections for the long term or in perpetuity, which is from, from the museum's viewpoint, in 1907, 1915, and 1948, Hubbard Peabody was actively trying to assemble a broad and extensive encyclopedic collection. So where else do we go from here? Is, um, I mentioned that there are, each one of these leads to another uh, one. But for now, on this particular project, having started in all those many years ago, we took a moment to celebrate a major milestone in bringing these collections home but remain focused on getting them the last leg of their journey. Thank you.